Treasury Secretary Tim Geithner is headed to China to join other world finance leaders at the annual G20 summit. What type of reception will Secretary Geithner receive and will U.S. monetary policy be front and center? And, uh, Jeff Papp is senior analyst at Oberweiss Asset Management. The firm's China Opportunities Fund invests at least 80 percent of its net assets in China securities. And Jeff joins us from Chicago. Jeff, welcome to Bloomberg's Bottom Line. Thanks so much for joining us today. No, nice to be with you, Mark. Uh, Jeff, the New York Times is reporting that uh, a prominent Chinese economist, Zhu Hong Kai, is uh, renewing Beijing's attacks on U.S. dominance of the world financial system, and he accused the Federal Reserve of playing an unfair and destabilizing role. Is this basically what we can expect over the next couple of days outside of this G20 summit? Yeah, I think that was the main point of the meeting the last time. So I, I don't think we're going to see quite the response that we saw last time when, when China pretty much came out and blamed the U.S., specifically the Fed, for their quantitative easing measures for putting too high of speculative capital into China, causing inflation to kind of be at a slightly higher than one level in China. When the fact of the matter is that the Chinese economy, when they shifted to a very accommodative uh, fiscal and monetary policies, caused a lot of the inflation that they're seeing right now. So I will think it will be a little bit toned down, but, but the underlying message is still there that the Chinese did clearly not like the Fed having very excess liquidity that, that found its way into China. So uh, quantitative easing, that's not going to be the whipping boy this time around? No, we don't, we don't really think so. Again, we think it's going to be centered on some of the hot topics today, like how is Japan going to be able to pay for the reconstruction efforts that are going, go, going to go on in Japan, as well as some of the issues surrounding the European debt crisis. And, and then once those issues are you know, talked about, we'll probably get back to center stage of how can we improve some of the large trade imbalances that we have. And some interesting points recently, we've seen China actually turn a trade deficit in the last month, which was, you know, somewhat interesting. And the, the pace of the RMB appreciation, too, has, has softened on the back of that data. So, so again, it'll get back to some of the old issues once the new issues are talked about. But the, the, the pace of the RMB, as you mentioned, has it softened enough to satisfy a lot of folks? No, we don't think so. And again, uh, it, you know, since last June, when China came out and said that they were going to be more flexible with letting the RMB float, we've seen a three and a half to four percent move appreciation for the RMB, which is a pretty significant move over a nine month time. Now, in the last month or so, we've seen that pace slow down a little bit as China actually posted a trade deficit, like I mentioned, of seven billion dollars in the last month. Now, some of this could have been manufactured. Some of it could have been due to the Chinese New Year last month, which always calls causes disruptions around exports. Or some of it could have actually been due to some Chinese producers seeing their input prices ride, go ahead and hoard stock of, uh, of raw materials to prevent further price increases from hurting their margins. So it's really too early to tell what the trade data meant from last month, and, and, and that'll probably dictate the, the pace of the RMB in the short term. Well, Jeff, we've also been, been hearing word that the European Central Bank, the ECB, and its uh, president, Jean-Claude Trichet, that maybe they might raise rates. Is that a cause of concern for some of the finance leaders this week? Yeah, I think so. I think they're going to talk about what happens when they start to take some of the punch bowl away from the party. And again, right. this is one of the reasons why we're, we're pretty positive right now on China is that China can start to see, for Chinese equities, we're starting to see the light at the end of the tunnel. And what I mean by that is China, China was clearly the first country to recover from the global crisis, the first country to pump in very accommodative policies, the first country to see inflation in a serious way as a result of the policy, and then the first country to shift to a more neutral, normalized stance. Um, and this acted as a headway for Chinese equities for the last year and a half. And we think now we're closer, much closer to the end than we are to the beginning. Now, this yeah. is, again, in stark contrast to what you mentioned to the U.S. and Europe that are just starting. So, again, I, I do think that will be a talking point in how taking away some of those policies will impact their economy. Well, another talking point, perhaps, is China out of options regarding inflation. Yeah, I think so. You look, they've raised interest rates a couple times. They've raised bank reserve ratios almost 10 times in the last nine months or so, and well as they come out and crack down on speculative areas like property. So again, they're kind of out of interest rate options. They could increase a few more times, but we think actually one way to, to neutralize and actually slow down growth a little bit is, is to let the RMB appreciate in a little faster way. Now, this, may rate, this is going to raise the prices for some of their exported goods, but again, net exports then their contribution to China GDP is really the swing factor in terms of whether they grow 8% or 10%. We all know Chinese consumption is very, very strong. Yeah. We all know China needs to invest in some areas in that 
8% growth is going to be the key. So, so whether they grow 8 or 10% really depends on what, what the pace of the RMB appreciation does. So, Jeff, going into this meeting, emerging markets, do they have a bigger role at the table? Are they being listened to this time around? Yeah, I think they, they have to. Again, this, this gets back to what they mean to the global economy. Obviously, China continuing to grow at 8 and 9% during the global credit crisis when the developed world was not growing at all. You know, that, that warrants great consideration. And again, as it gets to, well, does their currency deserve great consideration? My point is yes and no. Yes, it does in the longer term, but right now, until they allow, you know, the RMB specifically to be freely traded, you can't talk about it being included into a greater role like, like we've seen with the special drawing rights. So not yet. Yeah. Uh, Jeff, could I ask in our last minute when Secretary Geithner does meet with his counterparts, uh, we've been talking about the reception that he is going to uh, see or face from some of the other world finance leaders. Uh, what's their reception going to be concerning about how the U.S. is handling its monetary policy uh, aside from QE2, which we just talked about, but how it's handling its monetary policy and how it's handling its debt burden. Yeah, that's a good point, especially if we've seen the issues in Europe and what kind of uncertainty that has caused. So I think that'll be a talking point, too, and talking, you know, telling the U.S. to really get serious in terms of making significant budget cuts to get that debt ceiling under control. You know, we, we're, we're hearing about the government potentially shutting down here as they can't come to compromise on the debt ceiling level. And, and, and I think that will definitely be a talking point that the Chinese are going to make to the to the U.S. And, and, and telling them to seriously get their debt underneath control. So, so yeah, that'll be a key point as well. Jeff Papps, Senior Analyst, Oberweiss Asset Management, joining us from Chicago. Jeff, it's always good to have you on. Thanks so much.